Sorry, I had to hit the record button. All right, so here we go. So a couple easy things. Um, let's talk about the final project that's coming, that, you know, that hopefully everybody's working on. Just some basic concepts as far as what we're doing. The first part is your, the written assignment part of it is that you're supposed to write a paper about your photographer. So um, I think I alluded to it in last week's class, but just wanna make sure everybody's 100% understanding of what I'm looking for. Um, you can write your standard seventh grade biography. This is George Washington. He chopped down a cherry tree when he was seven. That's fantastic, but you're not in seventh grade anymore. You're in college. Um, not to be too much of a smart aleck, but the thing of it is, is what I try to bring to my classes is the idea that we're taking this class to sort of better ourselves, whether it be photography or that you're getting a degree, whatever it might be, you're trying to better yourself. And by having standard seventh grade level uh, book reports, I'm not sure that's really applicable in today's world. So I think that I like to try to challenge people to do better than that. So the first part of your written assignment um, should probably be some biography issues, um, in, information about the photographer. Um, in there, you can put some pictures of, of your photographer's work, but I don't want it to be a highlight of every photograph the person ever, ever took. It's more like a concept of you're trying to describe the person's style to me. So one or two pictures should be fine. Because I'm the one that makes the list, I know the photographers up and down, in and out. I know everything about them because I've been using the same photographers for a long time. So that comes with a caveat, it comes with a catch for you in that I know everything about the photographers for the most part. Maybe there's some information I haven't learned over the past 20 years of teaching this assignment, but maybe there isn't, maybe there is. Um, so I know that part really well. Uh, so you have to do your background checks, you have to do some information. Um, the last part of it is I want your opinion about the person's work. I want you to tell me in your voice an informed opinion about what you like or don't like or love or don't love, whatever it might be, about that photographer or their work. Maybe you like the work, but you don't like the person. Maybe you like the person, you like the work, or maybe you don't know what it means. That's fine. I want your informed opinion because if you're, again, I know that this is sort of not an offshoot of things, but, but when you're going for a job, when you get a job that's like based upon your degree, and you have a bachelor's degree or master's degree or whatever degree you're going for, and they ask you, hey, uh, hey, hey, Scott, you know, based upon your, 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 your knowledge, background knowledge, what do you think about this new advertising campaign for our company? And if my reply was, uh, yeah, it's kind of like, it's like, cool, I like it. It's, it's simple. It's clean probably not going to get a long distance on that that career move of, of doing that so you probably want to have a more informed opinion about what you're thinking that's what i'm looking for now you can also take it in a different slightly different way as far as how you write the paper the paper can also be written in the context of you take one small incident in that one small minor instant or time span in that person's life and write about that like there's a photographer uh, who went to um, the concentration camps at the end of World War II. And that was a, literally a life-changing event for that photographer. Their, the, their photographs prior to that event and the photographs after that event are vastly different. They couldn't be more different from one another uh, between those two styles. Maybe that's a neat story. Um, I sort of compared it last week to some movies. There's movies out there that are biographies about particular people that they don't, you know, those movies, when you look at movies like, for example, 42, if you haven't seen the more movie 42 uh, about Jackie Robinson, it's on HBO now, if you happen to have HBO now, um, an amazing movie. It doesn't start like th this is the day that Jackie Robinson was born and then it doesn't end with him dying. It's a very short encapsulation of time. It's only about a two year period of time of the guy's life but it tells the story so well. So maybe you can take an incident that that person had and write about just that. Because like I've mentioned before, I'd rather praise people who are willing to take a risk and try something, even if it doesn't work out perfectly, than a seventh grade book report level. So I don't need to beat a dead horse on that thing, but that's the concept. Now let's talk about the photograph that you're going to be creating. This week, I want you to contact me and we're going to set up a time to either uh, chat via telephone call or Zoom, private Zoom conference to go over what you figured out about that photographer 
and what your thoughts are for what you want to do as far as proceeding with your styled photograph. Now, it's not that you have to give me a presented concept. It's not that. Maybe you're not sure. Whatever it might be, I just want to go over with you some ideas as far as, okay, I saw this person's work. This is what I'm sort of thinking. What about this? Okay, let's go this. Or maybe I'll have an idea that works for you. Maybe it doesn't work. Maybe some different ways of looking at it. Okay, so this week, I need you to contact me and see what day would be best for you, but day and time would be best for you, and I'll do my best to accommodate everybody as best I can to do these Zoom conferences, okay, because it shouldn't take more than eh, 10, 15 minutes uh, for you to sort of show me, okay, look, I've collected the pictures, this is what I think the style is, and this is where we're going to go with it, okay, so that's part of your assignments this week is working on the written aspect of it, and then also to setting up a time to meet with me, so to speak, about going, is that a bug? That's my bug. Uh, I'm sorry, distracted, um, is going over the idea of what your photographer's style is, and how you can take that and apply it to your photography itself. Okay. All right. So let's get started with today, this week's assignment. Pretty easy stuff. Uh, but I, this is definitely the one that I enjoyed the most uh, in all my classes. This is by far and away the most fun that I love. Let me get rid of that and show you this. So we're going to do a thing on what's called force perspective. So force perspective is you've all done it. We've all done it as kids. Most everybody's done it as a kid. When you're a kid, oftentimes you can you do things where you, you cross things with your eyes or you, things like that. So let me show you a quick video. Um, uh, one, actually, there's two videos, quick videos uh, on forced perspective. It doesn't really show you how. It's kind of they're guess what? They're they're um, sort of smart aleck, smart smart alecky uh, videos. Shocker that I would have a smart aleck video. So that's con that's the beginning concept of what force perspective is. Um, this is sort of the same thing, but a bit of a takeoff of that. So this is a video. Oh, I don't, do I not have it on there? Oh, I thought I did. I apologize. I thought I had it on there. So anyways, it's a funny video. I think the school had uh, recommended I take it off. Anyhow, so let's talk about force perspective. The most common kinds of force perspective is the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Everybody seems to do this. Everybody, if you, if you haven't been there, you've at least seen pictures of what everybody does to the Leaning Tower of Pisa. So the Leaning Tower of Pisa, what does everybody do? They take a picture to make it look like they're pushing it over or holding up. So some people take pictures of themselves as they're pushing it over. Sometimes it's people holding it up. Okay, that's the other more popular way. Sometimes people get creative and do it with their feet. <clears throat> now, the weird part is I've never been there, but I've been told by a friend that they actually have vendors that sell ice cream cone cups, just the cup part. So you can do this. They actually have vendors that are, that's all they do is sell these ice cream cone cups. Uh, then you have smart aleck guys like me, probably that would be doing this. Uh, and then, of course, you have to do the meme. Original, uh, yeah, you all have it. So, because I mean, if you look back at the other pictures, you can see everybody in the background doing the same thing of trying to hold up the tower, leaning tower of Pisa. So that's truly a form of of forced perspective. You're making it look like the person who's in your picture is the same size as a leaning tower of Pisa. So what you're doing is you're forcing the eye to sort of recalculate what it's truly you're looking at because items that are closer to your camera appear larger than items that are be further away from your camera. Okay, so that's sort of the concept of, of force perspective. So let's talk about the, the true uh, definition of it. Force perspective is a technique which employs optical illusion to make an object appear further away, closer, larger, or smaller than it actually is. It manipulates human vision perception through this use of scaled objects and the correlation between them and the vantage point of the spectator of camera. 
that's a great way to describe it. You know, boy, that just rolls off the tongue as far as descriptions are concerned. Let's talk about the pictures, though. So there's lots of different ways. Remembering the Leaning Tower of Pisa is but one way of doing it. There's a hundred other ways to do it. This is a really easy one. So we, so as I show you these pictures, we're gonna break it down a little bit as far as how they probably did these pictures. This is a, could be couldn't be easier. They have this wall that they drew these sort of fake steps on, and it makes it. And she's just starting to like jump up and make it look like she's running up the stairs. So pretty easy stuff. This is a really easy concept. It's just an alignment issue to where you have the camera ready to go, and the person does this jump thing. Now, are you going to get it in the first? shot probably not uh you're probably gonna take a, a number of pictures you'd also probably want to pre-focus the camera we spoke about that last week as far as pressing the button halfway down to get the focus to lock in on where you want it that pre-focus concept is super important this week for this particular assignment okay so pre-focus is of utmost importance here's some more ones so you're making it look like you're holding a little miniature balloon so pretty easy, um, but the biggest trick, and I'll say this a number of times in this assignment, is the closest item has to be at least three feet away from the front of your camera. So when you're taking this picture, if this is the picture, if you're going to take a picture where you're crushing someone's head or you're crushing a balloon or whatever you're doing, you can't, when you go to take the picture, hopefully my camera goes wide now, when you go to take a picture, you can't have your hand, your hand like only a foot away from the camera. You have to have it reasonably far away from the camera as you take a picture. So you want to have make sure that your the closest item is at least three feet away from the front of your camera. If you get closer than three feet, it gets really difficult for this uh, perspective trick to work. Some of them don't really require any um, manipulation at all. It doesn't require any sort of ideas. It's just thinking about things. So by, you know, rotating the camera or rotating the image a little bit, it makes it look like this person screaming has this yelling effect. Okay, so some force perspective is different than others. This is what I really enjoy about this is the idea that you can sort of come at it the way you like, you know, and want to do. Again, not really any fancy you know, trickery here other than this kid is sort of, you know, laying, not laying in the street, but making it look like he's crawling up these, these, the, a wall when he's really not. So a couple key points to this one is number one is the person doesn't have long hair. If the person has long hair, this trick probably won't work because the hair is not going to hang correctly. The, hang, the hair is going to hang towards the street. So it wouldn't look, look correct. Same thing here. It's just a perspective concept is the fact that all I did is, turn, is they turn the camera sideways. So if we break this down, what do they do? So the person that's closest to this, the guy in the blue, light blue shirt, he's sort of, he's laying up, he's laying on his back on the ground with his feet up. The guy in the middle, the guy with the black shirt, he's laying on his side and hanging onto that pole as if he's you know uh, suspended. And then the guy on the very end makes it look like he's running. But the biggest trick of all is a couple things. One is that none of them have long hair because the hair would reveal the, the gravity pushing it the other way. Uh, also too, in this one especially, and the other ones I'm showing you, the light is the same in all of the subjects. Meaning that in, if they were all in the, they're, they're either all in the sun or all in the shade. If you have someone in the sun and someone in the shade, this trick may not work all that well. So it's really important to do a couple of things. One is make sure that your closest subject is at least three feet away from the front of your camera. Number two is make sure that everybody's everything is in the same quality of light, whether it be all in the shade or all of the sun. If you have mixed light, that's sometimes sort of it's going to betray the look of it. Let's see some more. Uh, this is out in uh, I think these were taken in Utah. This is not taken by me. But so here we have a picture where it looks someone looks like they're crushing somebody with their foot. So we have a couple of things. One is the foot is at least three feet away from the front of the camera. They're in the same quality of light. They're both sort of sitting in the sunny area. The trick of the, making this work is what we call uh, depth of field. And I'll show you that in a little um, uh, diagram I have in, in the other part of my assignment part of this. Okay, so we'll talk about how to trick the camera to make this happen uh, and make it work. Okay, again, some of them are just being uh, you know observant as far as looking around and sort of being observant to the world and saying, oh, you know what, that might work. 
So the holding something in your hand trick, not a great demonstration because the person's hand is closer than three feet. You still get the idea of it, but it's not perfect, mainly because the person's hand is closer than three feet. So the camera can't do both for the most part. Most cameras can't pull that off. Um, the challenge of this, though, is to be thinking about what's the perspective, the easiest giveaway, the easiest way to cheat on the particular assignment is by closing one eye. If you think, well, gosh, I don't know if that's gonna work. Close one eye, it'll tell you right away if it's gonna work. Secondly is when they do this, when you think about where the person's hand was, you know, if the camera's coming this direction, if they had the, the hand too much this way, you'd see inside the hand as you take the picture. Instead, they lean the, the, their hand forward, bless hard to do, uh, forward to get that sort of perspective of the back of their hand. Here's another one similar to what I showed you before, where it looks like the people are, are like suspended in midair. Again, all the things come in play as far as they all have sort of short hair or hair that's not dangling. Uh, they're all in the same light and everything's past the three foot mark. So does it meet the qualifications? More than three feet away? Yep. Same light? Yep. So it makes it look like he's suspending her. So he just is standing there with his hand slightly apart and the person is handing, standing there with their other hand up and make it look like they're suspending the person. Again, just observe observational stuff. Uh, so more than three feet away, same quality of light, yes. And just flip the picture a pinch. This is not the direction the picture was taken. Obviously you can sort of see that the person was either in the pool or at the very edge of the pool and just rotated the picture to make it look like that. Okay. So some of the force perspective requires you some really trickery as far as focusing is concerned. Some of it is just great observational issues like this. You know, that's kind of a great observational issue as far as observing where the, where the sun is, happen to be a cloudy, a cloudy day for this particular shot and putting it all together. This would be difficult to do in a bright sunny day. Most cameras can't pull that off in a bright sunny day concept. So if you think, man, I really wanna try that, um, unless it's a cloudy or overcast day, it might be a bit of a challenge for a lot of cameras to pull that off. I don't really recommend looking directly into the sun with most digital cameras, at least not in the bright sun and daylight sun, uh, because you've got basically a really good magnifying glass on the front of your camera that can literally burn holes in the sensor. So looking at the sun with your camera, probably not the best thing. So let's break this down. Uh, force perspective, it makes this guy in the front look bigger than the guy in the back. They're probably the same height people, but what do they do? So first of all, the guy that's in the foreground is closer to us than the guy in the background. That automatically makes our eye perceive to be things different. But objects that are closer are bigger, items that are further away are, are, are smaller. But what else did they do? If you look at the picture and sort of use your observational skills, you realize what they did is the guy in the front, they put him in a kitty chair. And the guy in the back, they put in a regular chair. So if you think for a second, if you've ever seen the movie Elf, the one with Will Ferrell, that has tons of forced perspective as far as how they filmed that scene at the beginning where he still up lives in the North Pole and he's in the Elf factory where they're making toys and stuff. They use tons of forced perspective to make that part of the picture because uh, the sort of the background story was they didn't have a lot of money for special effects. So they, used, they tried to use practical effects to make this work. Come on. There we go. So closer than the the for the close the subject in the foreground is more than three feet away, not by much, but a bit more than three feet away, and they're in the same quality of light. Now to make this trick work, we're going to talk about this depth of field challenge, but I'll show you that in a, in a graphic as we go along. I should get rid of that. Uh, that transition, that's a horrible transition. Okay, so let's talk about the assignment itself. Force perspective assignment. So, uh, same um, <laughs> description as was force perspective technique, employs optical illusion, yada, yada, yada. It's not that important. Neoblates human vision through scaled objects, yada, yada. That's the stuff that the school makes me put in these things. 
So your assignment is to create four images. This week's assignment is four images. The biggest, here's the biggest parts of this. The closest item should not be closer than three feet away from the front of the lens. Okay, because I can't overemphasize that enough. If you move things closer than three feet, there's a good chance this trick will not work in your camera. Okay, so it has to be at least three feet away, not 30 feet necessarily, but at least three feet away because cameras can't pull this trick off if it's closer than three feet. Uh, your camera should be set to a smaller aperture like f8 to f16. Prob so for this assignment, probably setting your camera to the A or the aperture setting would be your best rule for success. Okay, so putting the aperture to f8 to f16, somewhere in that range is probably going to be best range, best concept. Here's the most important part, and I have a slide demonstrating this. You should focus halfway between the foreground and the background subject. Okay, so if you're taking a picture like that picture I showed you, the person holding, they were holding up, uh, looked like they were holding up the, uh, uh, the space needle in, in Washington, uh, or the balloon one where they're crushing the balloons. They didn't focus on the person's hand, and they didn't focus on the balloons off in the distance. They focus somewhere in between to get what we call depth of field to focus both of them. And I have a, a little slide for that in, in, to show you. So when you're setting this picture up and you think, okay, you know, I think I'm going to make it look like that person. I'm going to have my friends stand in the parking lot and they're going to sort of stand like, all right, you know, like with this, with their, let's say they have a hoodie on. Of course, why would they wear a hoodie when it's 100? But whatever, um, I digress. They have a hoodie and they're pulling the hoodie up. Uh, they have the hoodie up. They have, you have another friend that's really close and you're going to make it look like they're picking him up by the hoodie. Uh, well, you'd want to focus because if you focus on your friend that's, that's three feet away, they're going to be in focus, but the other person's going to be out. If you focus on the person with the hoodie, they're going to be focused, but the person with the hand is going to be out. So you sort of have to sort of think in your head, okay, what's the halfway point between these two people? Sometimes I've even suggested putting something down on the ground. Go put a leaf down or a rock or something like that. And then what you do is you take your camera and you sort of pre-focus on that point, press the button halfway down, and then recompose the picture. One of the cool things about every digital SLR camera out there is that when you focus, when I press the button halfway down to make the camera focus, yeah. When you, oh boy, can I spell word for perspective? Boy, obviously didn't exactly hit the old uh, spell check on that one. Anyways, uh, let's go back to what I was talking about. With the focus, if I focus on something, sometimes when you have your camera really wide angle, it's difficult to get one spot to be in focus. Sometimes your camera wants to look around a little bit to try to figure out what's in focus. What you can do, every digital camera does the same thing, is if I take the lens and I zoom the lens in and I focus on that rock that I've put down that's halfway between my two friends, I press the button down and the camera goes, beep, beep, it focuses. Now, as long as I keep my finger on the button halfway down, I can zoom the lens back. So that's how a lot of us do some tricky stuff as far as focus control in like landscape and architecture, because we want one particular picture, part of the picture is in focus. So we take our camera, zoom all the way in, focus on that one little critical point, but holding the button halfway down, coming back and shooting. If you let go of it and then press it back down again, the camera's gonna wanna refocus and you may not be successful. Okay, so it's really important that you get the idea that you can zoom it all the way in, Press the button halfway down and hold it. You should get that dee -dee, that beep noise, as well as you should be able to sort of, there should be a green dot in the picture that tells you the cameras, yep, we're ready to rock and roll and shoot it. But if you let off, it's going to want to redo it. Okay, so it does take some practice, some adjustment to sort of get used to how things work. Okay, uh, last one is both the foreground and the background object should be in the same light. They should both be in the shade or both be in the sun. If you have it one way or the other, it's just going to betray the look. Okay, so let me show you a really quick video on some concepts as far as this, and then I have my slide to show you how to do the focus trick. Today, we're talking about forced perspective. Forced perspective is a technique which manipulates human perception by employing optical illusion to make objects appear larger, smaller. So this is from the Lord of the Rings. 
what you can't see is as the wagon's moving is, is that um, I don't remember the name of the actress. I'm not a big fan of the Lord of the Rings thing, but whatever. Um, that's my own world, right? Uh, this They're about the same height. They're not the difference, but what they do is he's closer than he is. And as the wagon's moving, you'll see this little block of wood behind him because they've rigged the system. To, they've rigged the, the wagon to be to make him closer than him, but not sort of fool your eyes. So watch the video as it sort of progresses here further or closer than they really been... see there was a piece of wood right there behind him and that sort of betrays that he's actually probably two to three feet closer than than elijah, than elijah wood i think maybe that's a question for the quiz that's elijah wood i'm pretty sure anyways um uh it's it, he's closer than him Star. you can use force perspective to create these optical illusions in photography and video production force perspective uses math and science you carefully control distance and vantage point. The further away something is, the smaller it will appear. So you have to carefully align objects at different distances to give the illusion the objects are in the same space, even though they are not. So you see what they did here is they have four cups, all in varying sizes, but because the closest one, again, just the way optics work, the way our human brain, uh, brain perceives things is that items that are closer to us appear larger than items that are further away. So even though these cups are radically different sizes, in the photograph itself, they appear to be the same size. So could this be, could this experiment be your assignment? By all means, you have four, three, couple, a couple different glasses that are varying sizes you wanna make to look the same size, give it a shot. But again, a couple things. One is notice that the three, they're three feet away, the closest item is three feet away or more from the camera and it's all in the same quality of light because if they had part of this in this like open shady area, shady area and part of it in the sun the trick wouldn't work as well oh damn carefully align objects at different distances to give the illusion the objects are in the same space, even though they are not. This uses basic geometry, degrees, and field of view. Take a look at this picture from the Fast and Furious Presents Hobbs and Shaw. Dwayne Johnson on the left is six foot five. Jason Statham on the right is five foot ten. So that's a bit of a difference. That's seven inches different in height. Do they look like the, that's there's a seven inch difference in height? It doesn't. But with this bit of forced perspective at work, he appears to be just a little bit shorter. How does this work? Placement of the objects. Dwayne Johnson is six foot five. That equals 77 inches. Jason Statham is five foot 10. That equals 70 inches. Divide Johnson by Statham and get 1.1. So in the shot, we need to make Statham look 1.1 times larger or make Johnson look 1.1 times smaller. That's easy. Statham just has to be 1.1 times closer to the camera than Johnson. Ask. So don't worry, I'm not going to make you do the math. <laughs> You're welcome. You don't have to do the math. Uh, it's just simple concepts as far as Dwayne Johnson is really tall. Jason Statham is not as tall. What do you think you should do? Well, Statham needs to be a little bit closer and Dwayne Johnson needs to be a little bit further away. So you don't have to do the math do one of a couple things just think of it and sort of prospectively look at it and close one eye and you should see it right away doing the math you realize Statham needs to be placed 10 feet from the camera compared to johnson's 11 feet set the focus and f-stop and boom the two actors look like they are just about the same height even though they're not you do use a lot of math and filmmaking and that is why you want to make sure you're paying attention in math lab now you can eyeball the effect with pretty decent results, but the math does matter when using miniatures and when you want a consistent outcome. But here I'm going to cover some basics, position, subjects, and camera. As I mentioned before, the closer the subject or object is to the camera, the larger it will appear. Similarly, when you want something to appear small, keep it far from the camera. Now the most challenging part is focus. You want the near object and the far away object to both be in focus. You'll want a fairly narrow aperture and F16 should do the trick. You might need to refresh on how aperture works if necessary, because this requires a small aperture, your scene will need to be well lit. Lighting is very important in making this illusion believable. If the objects have different lighting or are blurred, 
is going to make the effect look faint. A wide angle lens works better because they have a deeper depth of field using the same aperture setting. Anything under 35 millimeter is considered a wide angle. So go ahead and give it a try. You know enough now to mess around with it at home. Just remember to position the camera appropriately to achieve your desired effect. It can be a lot of fun trying to make it work. And if you post any of your videos, make sure you hashtag Studio NP. Yeah, we're not going to do that. So you can see that the concept is, is all the same, exactly what I spoke about, in that the fact that when we, if, we, if you think back to the aperture assignment that we had two weeks ago, uh, or three weeks ago, the aperture assignment was wide angle lenses tend to make things have a deeper depth of field no matter what you do. So most of the pictures I've shown you have been shot with a wide angle lens. They're not telephotos, they're not zoomed all the way in. The only time you probably wanna zoom is when you zoom in to try to focus in between the two spots. Okay, so let me show you the focus between the two spots thing. So you're gonna take a picture with your camera and you're trying to make your Dauschen look the same height as you. So to do that, if you focus just on the Dauschen, let me get out of this for a second because I can't use my mouse. If I focus on the Dauschen, the only area that would be in focus would be the area in front of the Dauschen and behind the Dauschen, okay? If I focus on my friend, the only area, only area that's gonna be in focus is the area that's slightly in front of her and slightly behind her. So to make this trick work, instead what we do is we focus somewhere in the middle, we put something down in the middle of the picture, focus on that, and that way the depth of field falls all the way to the dog and all the way to the person. Okay, so to make this work as far as some of the work things we've seen, the leaning tower of Pisa concepts, the crushing the balloons, the holding things like that, the crushing people, all of that works in this way that you're going to use somewhat of a wide angle lens, probably the F16 ish rule. Everything has to be in the same light. And you're going to focus somewhere halfway between the two people. So what happens when it doesn't work? Well, if you look at your picture and you, you know, when you look at the picture on the back of your camera, most cameras have the ability to zoom into the picture to where you can zoom in and take a look at the detail of the image. Well, is the person, is the item or person in the foreground in focus or the background person? If it's one or the other, then maybe you need to adjust your focus closer to this person or closer to that person to make it work. Okay. If both of them are out of focus, maybe the wrong aperture was chosen in the camera. Okay, so F16 should be pretty good for most situations uh, to try to make this thing work. Okay, so four items. So this week, your assignments are this, four of these types of pictures. Now, I don't want four of the same picture, you know, expand the concept and go to other things as far as what you can do with it. Number two is, um, the other assignment this week is setting up a time to get on a Zoom call with me just send me an email, send me a text and say, I have this particular time available. Are you available? And I'll let you know. I do a lot of shoots every week. Every week I have 15 or so shoots a week, but I can make time in between there. Sometimes it can be something as simple as an audio call, you know, audio Zoom call. There's a variety of ways of handling that. Okay. So let me get out of full screen. And um, do we have any questions about this assignment? Just as we're getting ready, if you're getting ready to type in any, any questions, grades are going to get caught up. I apologize for this. It's just that I get really busy. Uh, this last week was spent, in, a lot of it was in Lake Tahoe. I had a really big uh, mansion thing to shoot that I was up there for three days. Poor me uh, in Lake Tahoe. Uh, so I, I will get everything caught up in the next day or so because I don't have any shoots today and I'll get everything caught up. So do we have any questions about this assignment or the final project assignment? And that's Iron Man 2, by the way. Okay, not seeing any messages. Hello. <laughs> I don't like that. I, I, I like it better when I can see people, but I understand the concept. Okay. Any questions?
Ugly ugly. I'm not seeing any questions come in. Oh, there we go. Don't have a question about the assignment, but I have a question about the movies in the background. Uh, yeah, I try to put them in the I try to put them in the quiz, but obviously I've told some people have been telling me, and Ryan, you've told me before, is that sometimes my quizzes don't come through. I'll be the first to admit I have um I'm not bragging about myself, but I'm pretty good with the photography stuff, right? And Photoshop is like I'm great at that. Uh canvas not so much obviously my skill set on canvas is uh not that much plus it keeps you involved it makes people guess <laughs> what movies are going to play this week because like last week uh the evening class i forgot to put the tv on in the background and I had three different people ask me about what the movie was so hopefully that answers the question So any other questions? There we go. No, you're not missing. You're fine. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just weird. I, my goal would be to put it in the quizzes, but obviously I can, I've, I can master, you know, all sorts of cool photography stuff. I can master flying a drone in the middle of trees, but I can't seem to master how to make these bloody quizzes work. I can fly a drone. I've got to fly a drone in a warehouse, but I can't make quizzes work on this stupid canvas. So. Okay, well, I'm going to leave it at that. Like I said, so my my recommendation for everybody is let me know when a good time for you would be either through text or email, and we'll set up a time to do this. Like I said, it shouldn't take more than maybe 10 or 15 minutes for you to sort of uh, go over these things. You don't necessarily have to do a live thing because if you have, if you say, oh, I have this photographer, I already know what the photographer's pictures look like. So you don't have to show me what pictures you've collected. By me asking you questions, it'll reveal if you've looked up the person's pictures. Um, again, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page with that is one is when you're looking for the photographer's pictures, I would double and triple check the sources only because in this world now, if we, if we tag a picture with a, someone's name, it can come up in a Google search. So just because you, you put your photographer's name in and it came up on a Google image re reveal, that doesn't necessarily mean it's that person's work. That's why I would go through a couple different sites. Every photographer has a foundation website. Uh, start there and then branch out from there. You don't have to get 500 pictures to get someone's idea of a style. You, you know, you should be able to start to sum it up in 10, 20 pictures, something like that. Uh, but we'll go over that. Like I said, shouldn't take more than about 10 minutes uh, to go over what your ideas are. You can tell me, you know, I think I want to try this. Well, here's how you do it. Most of the photography work is not super technically challenging. I purposely made, got the list of photographers to where there's not like Photoshop involved and stuff like that. Most of it's pretty straightforward and simple stuff. Okay. Okay. Other than that, I don't see any questions coming in. So we'll wrap it up for this week. Um, I'll get everything graded up the, today and we should be good to go. And as always, please let me know if you have any questions. Um, I, again, I apologize if my, if my replies to you aren't timely, uh, but I just get a lot of shoots that I get to do every week. Poor me. Um, all right. We'll talk to everybody next week and I look forward to seeing your pictures this week. Have a great week.